not, not really more serious than that. The cycle of life is, of course, that we fork a process and then it crashes, and so we fork it again, but then it crashes again, so we fork it again. It's annoying when software crashes, but it's what happens, right? So what does a crash look like, right? We get a sec fault, for example, then K crash comes in, intercepts the signal, it launches Dr. Conkey, Dr. Conkey starts GDB, GDB spits out a trace, and then the user has to file a bug report. All of this is incredibly tedious and horrible. Who agrees? Okay, okay, I will, I will convince you all. So in KDE software, we kind of have a problem. So it is software, so it crashes. And then those crashes end up in Bugzilla. And who here has used Bugzilla? Who here liked using Bugzilla? <laughs> yeah. Case in point, sad developers, sad users. It's not ideal. So we have a crash, and this lovely pop-up pops up. Everyone has seen that, I guess. And then this lovely view comes up, which is now even more gorgeous than it was before, because now it's Kirigami. And then, you know, you go about your business and file a bug report, because, of course, for every crash, we file a bug report, right? Right? Yes? Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know what I'm talking about? And then this happens. The backtrace is not complete. You need to install the bug info. Oof. What is it, a bug info? What is a backtrace? We are asking a lot of the user here. So there are a bunch of problems with this. First of all, the user has to do something. You were laughing when I asked if we, uh, if we file a bug report for every crash we get, because of course we don't, because it is annoying and tedious and horrible. So we don't do it. The second problem is that the bug symbols, they are often missing, they are incomplete, the distro might have them in separate packages, in a separate repository, or perhaps not even available at all. <coughs> and there's also a reliability problem with this. Um, currently what we are doing is just-in-time debugging, which is, if we go back to the, to the earlier thing, blah, 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 this one is kcrash launches Dr. Conkey. So there's a time frame where the application has technically crashed but has not yet been attached to a debugger, right? Are we, anyone unclear about this? Okay, so in this time frame, the application can do whatever. It can crash in another frame. It can, it can run its threads and do magic, I don't know. It can try to do auto recovery, all of these things. And so that is a problem. It is a problem because we do just-in-time debugging. So we want to have the state as it was when the application crashed. But we don't necessarily have this because of the time frame in between where Dr. Conkey is not yet up. And so it's a re reliability problem. There have been bug reports to, doctor, uh, to this, uh, Discover, our software center, that showed crashes in uh, Live flat pack, which was weird because there was nothing weird going on in that particular frame, but it was crashing there. And the reason it was crashing there was precisely because of this time frame between between the actual crash and when Dr. Conkey jumps in and saves the show, right? So the flat pack thread kept running and eventually would crash in the flat pack thread because the states were messed up. So it's entirely horrible. So there are a bunch of solutions. Uh, that have come up in the past couple of years. One of the lovelier ones is CoreJumpD, which is uh, SystemD's answer to cra uh, caching crashes. Oddly enough, SystemD is now is, is also in charge of that, so it's not far to the complete operating system now. Um, so it is a system level core handler. Who knows what a system level core handler is? Okay. So when, when an application crashes and doesn't handle the crash, it, the crash gets deferred to the kernel, and the kernel then does it what's called a core dump, right? That's where the concept of a core comes from. It basically takes the entire memory image of the process and dumps it into a file. The more evolved concept of that is that one of a system-level core handler, which is essentially a program 
that receives the crashing application and then writes it to a silo, does whatever with it. In core dump D's case, it basically saves a bunch of metadata and then dumps the, the core to a file for later inspection. Now the lovely bit about this is that it has uh, disk usage limits, so it stores, I don't know, five different crashes, the, the last five different crashes on disk and all other ones get discarded. So you have automatic rotation of what is on disk, which means it doesn't grow out of control if, I don't know, Quinn is super crashy and you get a bunch of cores and then eventually your disk is full. That doesn't happen. And as I've said, it's recording metadata, which is also very lovely. Another interesting and important part to the, to the entire ecosystem is debug info D, which is solving this debug symbols problem that I've alluded to, right? It's one server to debug them all, one server to find them, one server to bring them all in symbol, bind them. Um, <laughs> it is precisely that. It is super simple, and I'm, I'm somewhat baffled that no one had this idea earlier. It's basically a cross-distro server that allows you to ship uh, the debug symbols in, uh, through a simple REST API to a client. Now, the client might be GDB, might be LLDB, might be some completely random other process. Who here has seen debug info uh, D in, in action? Okay. The rest of you will sure, surely see it in time. Um, so it's become uh, pretty much the standard in Arch Linux, I think. Um, so you need GDB 12, fairly recent release. And then your distribution needs to provide a server, and then you're basically set. You need to set an environment variable, and then GDB just goes, oh, give me the symbols. And then the server goes, yes, my time to shine. And yeah, it's fairly new. That's why there were not a lot of hands that got raised. Now, the industry standard is a bit different than that. The industry standard is you call home, first of all. That's super important. But it's also automatic, right? If, you, if, if, if your application crashes on Windows, then this annoying pop-up comes up and goes, oh, the application has stopped responding. Do you want to cancel me? And then you click cancel. But that also allows the industry standard to, be, uh, to, to cover, cover way more data and, and gather statistics and stuff. So wouldn't it be lovely if we had that too, right? So we have debug info D, which gives us debug symbols. That's amazing. We do have core dump D, which allows us to not do just-in-time debugging and eliminate that sort of uh, quirkiness. So wouldn't it be lovely if we had something like that? Well, yeah, we do. We do now, kind of. Many, many uh, asterisks attached to that. It's called Sentry. So what is Sentry exactly? It's a web application. And it does a bunch of stuff. It does symbolication. So if you have a crash and it's missing symbols, we don't need to care anymore because Sentry takes care of it. It's going to talk to the debug info D and goes, I have this frame at this address with this shared object. Can you give me the symbols? And then send, uh, the debug info D gives out the symbols. And it's going to be amazing. Um, it does event aggregation, so if you have crashes coming in from two different users that look exactly the same, Sentry goes, whoop, yeah, that's the same crash, let's find it together. It also gives us metadata, like what distribution was being used, uh, what version of the distribution, what version of the software, and a bunch of other lovely stuff that I'm sure we will eventually see in production. And that's kind of what it looks like. And of course, that's super boring. So uh, live demo time. Wish me luck. So this is where a zero day exploit is demonstrated live on stage. <laughs> I should hope not. <laughs> okay, so this is like the central cent uh, sentry view. Uh, does everyone see what's going on? Okay, perfect. Um, so we have a bunch of projects, and while preparing for this talk, I noticed that there was a bug in our Bugzilla bot. 
So our Bugzilla bot sends data there. We can already see a bunch of stuff. So first of all, in the past 14 days, it had no crashes. It was 100% crash free. Ooh. Ah, amazing. Um, and it has two releases. Now this down here is something that is specific because it's kind of like a web service. So it's sending uh, performance metrics to Sentry. It basically goes, I've done a request, I've done a request, I've done a request, and then Sentry goes, this request was way too slow. The user is gonna be in agony. What are we gonna do? But so what I've noticed is down here, we have a new issue. And so let's look at it. This is essentially a crash. It happened three times so far. It's probably gonna happen a bunch more times because what appears to be happening that I've made a boo-boo and there's an uninitialized constant. And indeed, here we have the code where the uninitialized constant is being used. That's this one here. And apparently that line just always blows up. We can see that this happens in our production environment, so the actual uh, Bugzilla bot that talks to Bugzilla and we get a bunch of metadata about the, the system that it was running on. Now, we can also look at something else, perhaps, performance I've already mentioned. Let's maybe take a closer look at it. So what we can see here is that the project API, that is the tag that powers release me uh, a bunch of our release scripts, the localization technology, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's hosted at projects.kd.org slash API slash, I think. And so we can also see that it has performance metrics on, 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 on that stuff. And if there were a problem where one of the endpoints would be too slow to respond, Sentry would send out a notification and go, users are in agony, help, help. Now let's look at uh, C++ crash, because obviously the first one was Ruby, wasn't particularly interesting for most of us. This is what a C++ crash looks like. This is actually from an actual system somewhere in the world that is using Dr. Conkey from, master, uh, from a master build. So what we can see, uh, the binary that crashed was console. This is the binary ID, the, the um, debug ID essentially of the binary that was built. Uh, we can see that this happened on Arch Linux rolling and it was the release 2081. Now if we scroll down, we can see the actual involved frames. So process info is valid, crashed. I would imagine that it was a null pointer, but we don't know yet. We can also switch between the unsymbolicated view and the symbolicated one. So as I've mentioned, debug symbols aren't necessary anymore because Sentry can just fetch them directly from the debug info D if available. So we might only get some of the symbols resolved. Like here we have the queued symbols resolved, but the console ones aren't actually resolved and they do get resolved through some location. So now we have context for the, um, the source file where the error appeared. Um, now this becomes even more interesting when we look for a very specific issue that I may or may not have caused in KIO. So if we look at the past 90 days, what we can see is that there was an increase in crashes here, and then it decreased again. Oddly enough, there was a bug here, right? So let's look at the bug. We can see that this bug has happened 404 times. Let's look at it. Did you find the bug? Yeah, I found it and I fixed it. After 404 days. Yeah, it, it takes a month to, to ship out, right? It's the problem with the release cadence of framework. Uh, so I analyze the problem, right? <laughs> and then Nicholas went, uh. I did, I did do both things, so I did fix it properly, I think. But so if we look at it, it's actually not a super useful backtrace because 
it failed in KIO directly. In KIO, we have a state assertion system, and we failed in assert. Super in obvious what the problem was, but what is interesting about this is here on the side. So here we can see different shades of colors for the OS, right? So this happened with multiple OSs, the biggest one being Garuda Linux, apparently, then Manjaro, and then Arch, right? So what we can tell from this information is that this bug must clearly not be uh, specific to one particular distribution. We can also tell that it is possibly not in one specific version either because it had different build versions, right? Now, obviously, they could still have the same patch applied that breaks it, but it's more and more information, and the more information we get, the better. And yeah, that pretty much gives us information. Um, another interesting thing, perhaps, is the de device family, uh, where we can know if it happens only on a laptop or only on a desktop. Uh, laptop, laptops, of course, having different use cases, like more plug and play than you would ordinarily do on a desktop. And anyone else wants, uh, anyone, does anyone want to see anything specific that you had your eye on, perhaps? Very good. So the other thing then is, how does this tie back into Bugzilla? And the way it works is if the user actually happens to file a bug report, Oh, I actually didn't really mention this to you. The data to Sentry gets sent the moment the user opens the developer information, not when filing a bug report. So we've removed this entire problem of having to open the thing and then uh, I was doing this and that and then Co Dr. Conky goes, this is not enough information. You cannot possibly file a bug report. Um, we've bypassed all of that the information gets sent right away, and then Sentry just fills in the gaps. But if the user decides to file a bug report, then we also get the information here. So Plasma crashes when trying to configure the sysguard widget. Probably deserves looking at, and apparently a bunch of people have looked at it already. Why is it not fixed yet? But yeah, so, it kind of, uh, the, the ultimate plan would then be to have Bugzilla also point back to Sentry and Sentry to Bugzilla, and then the two are uh, kind of linked together so we can have both systems at the same time and perhaps eventually move away from Bugzilla altogether. Any questions so far? Are you a, there's some online questions. Oh, yes, let's do some yeah. online questions. Bushan asks, uh, how does device detection work? Plasma mobile, or uh, does it detect plasma mobile as a mobile? That is a very good question, and I can't answer it without looking at the code. Um, it's so actually, let's look at the code because actually the code, the code is amazing. The code has no bugs because obviously there were no crashes. Uh, oh, we're asking system D for it, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't know. So once system D knows that it's mobile, then we will know too. Okay, we have another question. Uh, so Sentry is really cool. I've used this in the past, mostly for web stuff. Never thought about using it for C++ compiled stuff. The question I have is, have you found a way to make this stuff work offline? Um, no. I mean, yes, but no, but yes, but no. So um, what happens is, uh, it's probably not super interesting to look at, what happens is that we compile a, a payload through GDB Python scripting. 
So we construct a JSON payload and then send that off to the Sentry server, right? In an offline scenario, we would just store the JSON payload for submission at a later date. And then you would have like a system D timer that runs continuously and checks if there are pending payloads. So it can be done, uh, it's not done right now. Store and forward is where it's at. Yeah. Other questions from the room? I see a question way back there. Can you expand a little more on how it works and like what it sends? Like you've just shown it sends some payload out, but like I can't imagine you sending a core file to the network, but can you expand like how it does and what it does and whatnot? Um, Especially in terms of privacy and things. Yeah. I can, I can, I can show you. <laughs> so it does this, right? Um, do with that information what you want. So um, essentially it's, I have to go way, way back to the beginning. We are still invoking GDB and GDB has scripting APIs. So we can have a Python script that runs in GDB and allows us to inspect the process from within the Python script. So what we then do is we run through all the frames in the, in the trace and for each frame we record the information of the, uh, the file at the, the, the memory location, the file that was at that memory location, and if possible also the debug information, if available. Um, this is essentially the payload, right? And we do that for all the threads, and then additionally we attach the metadata payload, which is the stuff down here, right? So it's like timestamps and, yeah, the release from your always release file, that sort of thing. The question behind you. Right? If you're still launching GDB in the end, how does this solve the latency problem between the crash? And ah, crash? yeah, yeah. Okay, so core dump D solves the latency problem. Um, you can GDB on the core that has already been written. Oh. Yeah, I'll show you. Maybe. Maximum wobbliness. Okay, so if we do quorum control, these are all the crashes that had happened on this system. And we see uh, most of them are quite old and uh, the column here says missing, so the, the core file is no longer available. So we will look for one that is actually available, which would be this one. So this is the information that Codump D has recorded about this crash, right? So far so good. It recorded the PID and the UAD and so on and so forth. That is more or less all the information that we would have available at runtime regularly. So what then happens is that if we attach GDB to that, we can run a backtrace on the core, right? So this is no longer just in time. k write crashed a while back. But since Quorum D recorded the core, we can still debug it. So this is no longer just in time. Right? But that is unrelated to Sentry. That is an improvement that is already landed, and Sentry is still under evaluation right now. Okay. Thanks. Um, Uh, how to use it in your application. Yeah. Um, um, ideally, you don't need to do anything because it wires into the existing Dr. Conky framework. So if Dr. Conky works, Sentry will also work. Um, there's some management stuff that I need to do to actually filter out the projects. So, so if we look at our projects here, there is one very notorious one, which is called fall through, which oddly enough connects, collects everything that has fallen through the net of other projects. <laughs> so unsurprisingly, it had a number of errors. But yeah. Um, so ideally, you don't need to do anything. So Sham has another question for yes? you. And that is, how do we do this on FreeBSD? Oh. <laughs> 
yes. <laughs> oh, of course, yes, yes. I'm, I'm certain he is. Yep. And, and the other non system D, non core DOM control. Yep. yep. So the entire core DOM thing is separate, right? We can still do just in time debugging. So nothing's changed. Everything's still the same as it was two years ago, except if you're in system D and except if you opt into this core DOM D stuff, right? But the sentry stuff is unrelated, and so you can still have the sentry bit on free BSD without code on feed. All right, thank you. And Julius asks, when will we see this on our desktop? Well, if you use Git master, then already, but only then. So this is currently under evaluation, uh, sentry as a platform. There are still some quirks we need to iron out. There are still some features that we are not quite happy with how they integrate with our GitLab instance. So uh, technically, we can link up the, the traces that we've looked at to the actual source file, like we've seen with the Ruby crash, where it actually referenced the source code. We can do the same for C++, but we need GitLab linking. And that currently is not quite where we want it to be. Um, so maybe six months, maybe 12 months. We'll have to see. It will be a while. OK, one more question from the audience. You mentioned that the backtrace only gets sent if I go to develop information. Yeah. But normal user doesn't go to develop Yeah. Um, it's only for the, uh, in, uh, it is this way right now. Um, but ultimately, we wanted to just send the, the information right away. But since it's still under evaluation, it's basically kept behind the developer information. There is also um, a more difficult problem to solve there in that how do we distinguish a dirty build from a pristine build, right? If you are doing development on Plasma Shell and Plasma Shell crashes because of something you've done on your dirty tree, um, we don't really want to know about it in Sentry. Uh, another question? Uh, yeah. Yes. That is a good thought, yeah. That whatever the comment was is not on audio. Yeah, it was a good thought. So <laughs> the idea was. Please repeat the comment. The comment was, uh, uh, it should be relatively easy to figure out if the tree was dirty by just looking up the, the build ID in the distribution, right? If the distribution doesn't know about the build ID, the crash is valueless anyway. Um, yeah, good thought. So as I've said, Python scripting is really amazing. Uh, if you do ever do anything with GDB, then do try the Python scripting, especially if you find yourself repeating the same steps, like, I don't know, starting an application, setting a breakpoint, and then running it five times, and then having the breakpoint hit. You can totally script that using the Python scripting. It's really amazing. And with that, uh, I'm really done now. <laughs>
Thank you.